All right, good morning, and welcome to the Rutgers IT Lecture Series. My name is Bill Lansbury, and I'm the Associate Vice President for Enterprise Infrastructure, and I will be facilitating today's uh, lecture, WebEx and Zoom, the fall semester and beyond. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you that today's session will be recorded, and the lecture and slide deck will be available later this afternoon. You will receive a notification email once the information has been posted to it.rutgers.edu forward slash Rutgers dash IT dash lecture dash series. Don't need to write that down. We'll include that later on in the presentation. This URL also, if you did not have a chance to participate in volume one, collaboration done right, leveraging Office 365 and Microsoft Teams, that recording is also available. Now I'd like to introduce our Vice President and Chief Information Officer, Michelle Noren, who will say a few words and introduce a very special guest. Michelle? Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad to be here to help uh, kick off our session for today. Um, I wanted to say a few things first before, uh, before we move on here. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm very glad we're having our session. This is the second session in a series of, of events that uh, we're going to have throughout the year uh, to create opportunities for us, our community, our profession to learn from each other, to, to, to share, uh, you know, ideas and concepts and um, just to really build opportunities for us to continue to connect and, and, and hear from each other and learn from each other. Um, special thanks to the organizers um, of our events. Again, our original plan for these were to um, have a day where we could all get together face to face and, and uh, get to know each other a little bit better in that setting. Um, but, uh, but we've had to pivot, right? I think everyone has been in that mode in terms of remoting and getting set um, for learning how to operate uh, remotely. And so special thanks to the, to the committee for reworking, laying out the series over the year around different concepts. Uh, and I'm confident that uh, uh, next year or when we're ready, we'll, we'll be bringing ourselves back together face to face. So uh, special thanks there. I also want to, um, say special thanks to our speakers today. Uh, the topic around Zoom and WebEx is very timely. I'm sure uh, <laughs> that's why we're having this today. But I know that our community is very reliant on these tools, um, very reliant on all the work that all of you are doing to make sure we have the tools in place, the support is there, people are getting connected, they're learning and teaching and working as uh, most effectively as possible. And, you know, again, I've said this before, I'll say it again, we can't be remote without the technology. So our work, your work is critically important today, uh, given the mode that we're in. Uh, and so I, I wanted to express uh, sincere appreciation for, for, uh, for all of your work there. We've got a ways to go. Our, our, our mode in the fall will be mostly the same mode that we're in right now. And, uh, and so it's gonna continue to be critically important. And I also wanna just uh, acknowledge all of your personal space. I know that uh, we all have different circumstances and I appreciate your willingness and ability to stay focused and keep moving things forward. I, it can be challenging at times, uh, you know, with different things that I know we all have to balance in our personal lives. So um, a lot of appreciation around that uh, to you all as well and recognition of, of your efforts. So thank you for all of that um, today and, and going forward. So before we go into our topic today, though, we do have a very special guest with us. So excited to introduce um, our new president, and I'm going to stall a minute <laughs> as we're getting connected. I, are, you, are you hearing us now, President Holloway? Before I, I, I am. Okay, good. So before you start, I, I just want to welcome you. Um, we are uh, President Holloway eagerly accepted the invitation to say a few words today. I'm so pleased about that and glad that uh, you're able to join us. Um, 
Dr. Holloway is our, our 21st president. Started July 1, he was the provost at Northwestern. Before North, Northwestern, he, he was a dean at Yale College and just so glad to have him joining the, the, the Rutgers community, already having such a positive effect and um, very appreciative of uh, his willingness to carve out some time to say a few words to, to us today. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, President Holloway, to, uh, to, to say a few words. Thanks, Michelle. And I'm, I apologize for, I mean, isn't it fitting that I started to have these IT challenges? Um, I was on a call, a video conference 15 minutes ago and everything was working perfectly fine. So I don't know what to tell you. I, I, so I don't put, I'm sure I did something somewhere. Um, uh, so I apologize for that. Um, you know, the setup that I have in this office now at home, although it, something got quirky with this particular effort, is really spectacular. So I did want to thank Roger Williams and his crew for putting together a really nice setup in a kind of a, a tricky situation in the house. Um, believe me, if you could see the camera set up the way it's set up, you'd be like, that's first class work. Uh, Sorry, just the audio wasn't wasn't um, cooperating. Um, you know, this is actually it. It, it, it this gives me a, an opportunity to tell a story that um, just bear with me a little bit. It's about another university, but it really speaks to um, the importance of the work that all of you do uh, when, from an administrator standpoint. So, in 2015, I, when I was at Yale, as dean of the college and we were going through a really complicated political situation on the campus. I mean, a lot of universities were. And um, we were having emergency meetings being called and one was called for the first thing in the morning at something like, let's call it 7.30 in the morning. And that's exactly the time when I was driving my daughter to school. So I would have to call in. And meanwhile, seven or other, seven or eight other senior leaders were up in a conference room on a remote part of campus, and three or four of us were calling in. So at the appointed hour, I call in and we're chatting for a few minutes, and all of a sudden the line goes dead. And it's just pure silence. And so three or four of us on the calling in on, and you know, this was not Zoom, this was not um, WebEx, this is just a conference call. Uh, three or four of us who were calling in remote were chatting with one another like is it working for you so on and so forth i'm driving i can't do anything but just you know be on speakerphone and then after about 45 seconds or a minute of us talking with one another the sound kicks back in and it turns out that our whole conversation was being beamed into the conference call room where the seven or eight other people were were, were chatting the whole time and we were like talking over them they could we couldn't hear them so on and so forth and the president who was never one to curse, um, said, and this is the goddamn problem, is that we can't get a conference call to work, and yet students last night, and this is true, the previous night, they, uh, 200 students rallied and went to his house around 11.45 at night. I had to wake him up, let him know they were coming. He goes, and students, you get 200 students can get organized off of an app in 15 minutes. This is asymmetrical, we, we can't do this. So he was just venting at sort of everybody and nobody. But it does, I tell that story um, because it speaks to the challenges of this era that we're in and I think we're gonna be in, I can't imagine not being in this, in this moment where our students have been born digital as it were. And the adults, at least for another 10 years, I'll say, the, adult, the administrators, well, for the senior administrators, probably another 20 years, we were, we were um, um, uh, oh my gosh, we were not digital. We, we were, we were, starts with an A. I can't even think of the word. See, this is the problem. This is the problem right here. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we cannot, communicate at the pace the students do, nor do I think we should, because so many of the issues that we're dealing with require patience, contemplation, and nuance, um, that, um, that this, um, the immediacy of the digital environment is not, is not built for. Um, thanks, Roger's analog. Yes, Roger texted me. <laughs> and <laughs> so, 
at least I had my email pop or a text pop up. And so I'm sort of somewhere in between. But, but in all seriousness, it does really speak to the importance of our ability from the administrative standpoint to be able to connect or to have professionals around us who can actually problem solve, just like Roger did um, uh, for me on the, on, the, on, the, on the spur of the moment. Um, but you know, and this is more than just the audio going wonky on a, on a Zoom call. It's like, how do we even connect with our community? You know, I have, I have resisted and it may change, but when I was at Northwestern and now here, um, well, I had a Facebook page until the day before I became president. And the Facebook, I posted four times a year for each of the kids, the, the family birthdays, that was it. And um, the, uh, and then I had like, actually I have an Instagram page that has 10 images and I've had the Instagram page for like eight years. I mean, I just, you know, I don't, I, I make choices about not being active on these spaces. And um, folks have been frustrated. Well, you need to be a 21st century president. You need to be out there. And, and, I, and this is not a critique of anybody in the IT world or social media, but I want to hang on to certain things in the analog conception of how to run a university, how to be involved. But I need to have people around me who have their fingers on the pulse. And that's where, um, you know, Roger's my main interface. That's where Roger clearly comes in. And so I'm grateful for the work that all of you do to make sure that we are at our current or proximate current is sort of the way I sort of think of it um, so that we can do our job. I mean, this is, this is um, um, you know, I recognize that you provide the critical infrastructure to keep Rutgers running in all kinds of ways that I know about and many more ways that I have no idea about. And I'm grateful for all of you for the work you're doing in, in all of those regards. I understand that this is um, um, a, a new lecture series, if I understand it correctly, sort of new way of engaging IT. And it really, as I understand it from Michelle, this is part of a larger sort of one IT, uh, um, I'll just call it a framework. If that's not the right word, Michelle, you can correct me. But it, I just wanna say that it totally aligns with the kind of, um, approach I'm bringing to the job at Rutgers in that Rutgers is, boy, is it a complex institution. I mean, more so than just a typically complex institution with all the different chancellor led units and all the different ways that you know that it's complicated. Um, one of the things that is at the top of my list is trying to find ways to make Rutgers coherent as a university. Um, you know, if, if I had to describe Yale, I could do it in 15 seconds. It's a humanity-based research university. If I had to describe Northwestern, same thing, 15 seconds with my little pitch. With Rutgers, it's one president, four chancellors, five provosts, division one, division three, research one, research two, AAU with an asterisk, because that's only some of the units, not all of the units. That is a very difficult proposition if someone whose job it is is to tell Rutgers' story in order to secure resources so that we can make Rutgers, help Rutgers climb ever higher um, in the hierarchy of research universities. And that's a job I take on with great enthusiasm, but I need to find ways in which to simplify the story so that people will know that when we're talking about Rutgers, you're talking about all of Rutgers, not just Camden or Newark or New Brunswick or RBHS, but all of Rutgers. So for me, that's a culture change as far as the narration of the university. Um, but it's going to also mean a systems change in the parts that are underneath that, that, that sort of outward cultural declaration what Rutgers is. And that's where one IT, as far as, as I understand it, fits right into that, into that mission. Now, Michelle, pre that predates my arrival, um, but it's so great knowing that that is, that logic is already built into place that we can build upon as, as it matures. Um, that I can lean on it as I tell my story about Rutgers. So I want to thank Michelle for that work and thank everybody for what you're doing to help fulfill that kind of vision. Um, you know, I, I'm going to take just another minute or two, Michelle, if that's okay, you can nod. And, uh, yeah, the, you know, I, I, just to, so you understand some of the um, things that are happening, you know, I've spent really 
I would say three months in transition. My transition work really started mid-April. I couldn't visit New Jersey, of course, so it was all done remotely. And um, and now I'm, you know, I'm here, I'm running, I mean, ostensibly running a 100,000 person community. I've only been in two buildings so far, maybe three, but I know two for sure. So I'm still kind of sorting out Rutgers in many ways, but even though I'm not able to get into the physical space, um, and I, even though the campus is not gonna be alive like it normally is, there's still work that I can do to help organize Rutgers from the standpoint of, of leading with values and principles so that it becomes a, the best version of itself. And one of it is that one Rutgers mentality. Another part is really, I'm really committed, and you'll be hearing stuff about this over the course of my tenure, really committed to lowering barriers in terms of, what pe of how people understand what the central administration is, what is happening in Winant's Hall symbolically. You know, I really want to find ways, I mean, I, I'm going to be, when we're up and running post-COVID, you know, very public president out on campus or campuses uh, being engaged in that way. But I want my central leadership team, and Michelle is a key component of it, to reflect that kind of approach that we are going to be as transparent as is reasonable in terms of running a complicated organization. Um, we are going to, you know, I don't want to surprise ourselves. I want a much more robust internal communication so we can, we, we, the left hand knows what the right hand is doing. Um, IT will be critical in all of that, of course. And I want to build an administration where, as I said during my introduction back in January, that an administration that recognizes people who are doing work, no matter where that work resides in the university. And a lot of work, I know from other, from my previous experiences at Northwestern and Yale, and saying, can't be any different here, a lot of that work in the IT world is invisible work. As I said earlier, a lot of stuff that I rely on, I don't, I, could, I don't know how to do it. This is why I need you all. Um, and I don't know what else is, I don't know what else we are that makes my life easy, that is resting upon the work that IT does. So it's very important to me, um, you know, when I was invited, I said yes right away, because it's important to me to, to let you know that I acknowledge the work that you're doing, even though I don't understand it from a technical standpoint, I just know I need it. And I appreciate it when it, and it comes across and it so far has been really first rate. Um, and, and Roger in particular has been very patient with me when I've asked sort of like, look, I know this is a silly question, but you just got to help me solve this problem. I mean, I need that kind of that assistance. We all do. So I want to acknowledge that. But I also want to, not but, and I want to build an institution that as long as being transparent and acknowledging the work that's going on, that is really committed to understanding that um, excellence can be found everywhere. Uh, that there are so many people in our community right now or who are not yet part of our community that have all these incredible talents that aren't being tapped into because of belief systems that say they presume that, you know, a person of this gender can't do this thing. A person of that race can't do that thing. And you know what I'm talking about. We gotta get past this. If we are going to become as great as we can be, we need to be committed to an aggressive search for excellence, knowing that it looks like everybody and with the right kind of mentoring um, investment of time uh, and, and open and, and, and sort of an open sensibility about um, how that can be expressed, we'll become so much better than we are now. And I wanna have an administration that's committed to that kind of work that you know, broadly speaking is about diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, but I really want to emphasize that that um, my notion of diversity uh, is really quite robust. It's not just about people who look a certain way. It's about a commitment to an ideal that we want to find the best answers to complicated problems. And the best way to do it, and we know this from a scholarship standpoint, is to bring people from a variety of backgrounds. Diversity understood in its complexity. Bring people with a variety of backgrounds together to troubleshoot or problem solve. That's how things get done. And I've seen this at play when a crew of IT professionals come to my house and you know, the three or four people have different bits of expertise about how something operates. 
and one of them alone is not going to be able to solve their problem, but three of them together, like, oh, that's it. That's what, and they, and they can just make things happen. Um, so that's a very crude kind of example, but it's an example that I think um, has relevance across a system as complex as Rutgers is, as nuanced as Rutgers demands of its population. So if you are collectively a team that understands that, that is willing to get behind that philosophy, you are going to be so critical to our ability to realize our ambitions to be one of the very finest public research universities in the country. And with Michelle leading you, I know she's on board um, and I have complete faith in what she's doing and support her, her efforts. I know we're going to get there. And I want to thank you for helping us get there in advance. Thank you so much. Great. Thank, Thank you, you President Holloway. Yep. Go ahead, Michelle. Yep, no, oh, go ahead. What are you saying? I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't yeah, say this okay. earlier. Go ahead. Yeah, go. It's Jonathan, for God's sake. <laughs> it's Jonathan. It's Jonathan, yes. Now, if I'm, of course, if I'm standing in a room of other presidents, I'd prefer not to see President Smith, President Jacobs, and Jonathan. <laughs> I mean, so, you know, there's moments. But we're, you know, we're in this together, right? We are a team and we need to support each other. I'm, I'm as much here to support you as you are to support me. That's my approach. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> Thank you for those, uh, those comments and observations. Greatly appreciated. And uh, if, if you're ever going to have a problem, again, this is the setting to have it because everybody who needs to help you solve it is here on this call. So <laughs> glad we got that resolved. So at any rate, I'm going to turn it over to Bill. Uh, and again, thanks, Jonathan, for joining us today. And you're welcome to stay and learn about Zoom and WebEx if you would like. Um, uh, but uh, but yeah, we've got we've got a great great set of information to get through. So well, okay. it's clear that I have to learn about Zoom, even though I use Zoom all the time at Northwestern. I don't know what happened just there. That's very strange. But but I do have to leave for my next meeting. So um, thanks for understanding that. And and we'll troubleshoot this audio thing. Sounds good. Okay. Right, take thank care. You. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Right. Turn it over to Bill. Yep. All right. I would like to introduce David Heller, who is the Associate Director of Enterprise Infrastructure, Telepresence, and Collaboration. David? Thank you, Bill. Now I'd like to introduce my collaboration team, David Gates. Now Dave's on mute. Well, good morning. I'm learning audio too, it seems like. <laughs> Thank Thanks you, David. Great. Janelle Park. Hi, guys. I'm Janelle Park. Uh, thanks for joining this webinar. And your manager, uh, Ron Paris. Hello, everyone. I'm Ron Paris, and I'm leading the group that has been implementing WebEx and Zoom here at an institutional level, and I work for David. So with that, we'd like to kick off the technical portion of this presentation, WebEx, Zoom, in the fall semester, and beyond. I will start off with going over our agenda real quick. We are going to be covering WebEx and Zoom, of course, but also talking about the usage, the features, what is now here, and what is coming. So this is the overall agenda. WebEx has been around a little while. And as you can see, we have about 39,000 accounts, 17,000 are faculty and staff, and 21,000 are students. This means that it is the largest by and far means of remote communication here at Rutgers. And as you can see with the graph at the bottom here, pre-COVID, run up to remote instruction, and then remote instruction, it has grown by leaps and bounds. It's stable, and an LMS integration is actually going to be occurring tomorrow. So that means for folks that are interested in running WebEx in Canvas, you'll get an announcement in a few minutes, and then a way to go tomorrow. Zoom is new. We, but we already have 11,000 accounts, despite, as you can see here at the bottom, just having folks starting to sign up around 
the 23rd. It's been consistent and people have wanted it quite a bit. There are two main groupings or tenants that folks are using it in. One is for HIPAA users that handle private information and the other is the general account. There is an extremely high user demand and folks can get integrations, which will be explained a bit later, that is the ability to bring in third-party applications for scheduling and other services that would just need to be vetted. LMS integration for that is coming next week, as you can see as well. So we have two very good tools that we have set up and are going to continue to work on going forward. Now, since we're in a bifurcated location and everybody is working from home, we wanted to build a chart, which was linked later on. This is just the header over here of what the differences are amongst the three institutionally supported, centrally supported platforms being Microsoft Teams, WebEx, and Zoom. So all of that information is up and posted so you can do the comparisons and find what works best for you. This is both on and off campus. Because we have existing telepresence, as you can see here, we have the immersive classroom and various pieces of hardware, but we're going to continue to innovate and move forward day on day to meet the needs of the upcoming fall semester and beyond. So that all educators, as Dr. Holloway was talking about, Jonathan was talking about, was can actually do their jobs no matter where they are. So with that, I'd like to transition to using WebEx at Rutgers. If you notice here on the upper right, there is the Q&A button for everyone to submit their questions. We will have a lively Q&A session at the end. I'll be going over some of the most common questions, but folks that want to submit their own are welcome to. And with that, Juno Park, please take us away on to using WebEx at Rutgers. Uh, thank you for joining this webinar. Uh, I'm Juni Park, and um, I'm going to talk about what the WebEx is and what kind of features you can have. So this is a WebEx overview session. WebEx is a tool that allows users to host or join in video meetings. You can simply log into WebEx and schedule uh, classes or meetings and it will sync to your O365 calendar. So you don't need to find the invitation you got or you sent. Just go to the calendar and click the join button and then you can join the meeting. And also if you installed a WebEx desktop app or O365 add-in, it will give you a notification and you will find them on the app. So we, you will never miss them. So who can use it? Rutgers all students, faculty, staff, and even guests will get the same features. WebEx meetings, events, and training, and also you don't need to request additional licenses and features. How do I get it? Uh, it's very simple. Go to netid.rutgers.edu, and as you can see, uh, here's yellow highlight part. Click the service activation and check Rutgers WebEx, then you'll be able to use it. So there are three different WebEx suites, and this is a simple comparison chart to help you choose the proper WebEx for your meeting. First, you should consider what kind of meeting you will have and how many attendees will you know, join the meeting and what features you need or the attendees want. Let's look at the chart. If you need a simple meeting with your coworkers or students, WebEx meeting will be the best solution. This is designed for a small meeting in which user can start and join easily. You can simply schedule a meeting and send a notification, I mean invitation. Or if you want to have a quick meeting, then you can use your personal room meeting, which you can start to any time without scheduling. Up to 1,000 attendees can join WebEx meetings. What about large scale events like webinar? If you need to schedule a large webinar, WebEx event will be the best because it supports up to 3,000 attendees. 
and it gives you more control over setup of your webinar, like registration, polls, and Q&A. And think about it, when you have a webinar, the host cannot do everything. There'll be a lot of questions and the host will be very busy. So you need to assign panelists and there will be speakers, presenters, Q&A manager, and polling manager. Also, attendees can be muted automatically upon entry. So keep chatter to minimum. And the host has full control over when they are allowed to speak. So the host can mute and unmute the attendees manually when needed. The last one, WebEx training. Uh, this is a designed for distance learning and certification. Attendees can easily concentrate on the present, presenter and content. The host can assign panelists just like WebEx event and have Q&A polls as well. Uh, there are two nice features for WebEx training. The first one is that uh, WebEx training provides breakout room sessions. You can create breakout rooms and assign attendees or students into the breakout rooms. So they can share content and talk about it in the breakout room. The host can create up to 100 breakout rooms with 100 attendees in the breakout room. And second, you know, amazing thing is testing and um, scoring. So before starting the training session, you can create some exams or pop quiz and you can launch the test and grading them during the meeting and export the result. So this is a simple guide to help you understand what kind of WebEx suites there are. And let's talk about details and limitations. On the previous page, we have talked about three different uh, WebEx suites. Now with this comparison chart, you can figure out the ins and outs of them and what you can do or what you cannot do. Uh, for example, if you want to stream your meeting on YouTube or Facebook, you should pick WebEx meetings or events because WebEx training is not available for streaming. If you, want, if you are not familiar with you know, WebEx and not quite sure what WebEx you should choose, please look at this chart and find the best WebEx you need. Next, you can start join a meeting from anywhere on any device, but there are some limitations depending on what you use. You can use a browser like Firefox, Google Chrome, or Microsoft Ads, but in this case, by default, you will get only active speaker and thumbnail layout. This is a limitation, so if you need to grid view, please use desktop app. And also WebEx event and training cases. Authentics can join the meeting from any device, but the host must use the desktop app. This is a limitation. Okay, let's look at the WebEx meeting in user interface. Uh, in the meeting by default, you will get a full screen of active speaker with thumbnails here. Uh, if you want, you can use the layout button to change and the control bar shows all the essential features you need, audio, video, and content, participants list, and chat box. The control bar auto hides when not in use and it reappears as soon as you move your computer mouse. The user interface is really simple and easy to understand. And also if you have dual monitors, you can use floating window views to scale each panels individually and move them to second display. So you can see the content on the left monitor and the other participants video on the right monitor. So you will get better video meeting experience. Uh, this is really similar to WebEx meetings user interface. You can see the same control bar and participants list on the right, but only the host and panelist video will be visible. And attendees are audio only and they'll be automatically muted upon entry. And also there is a feature for WebEx events and training, which is participants attention tracker. You can find out who is paying attention or not during the meeting. The attention indicator uh, exclamation icon shows if the, ten, if the attendee has minimized the WebEx ad or opened the you know, browsers during the class or um, webinar. You can turn it on, turn it off during the class is optional. Next, WebEx training. 
as you can see WebEx training, the video window is smaller and content portion is bigger. But you can see the same feature as other WebEx. But the only different thing is WebEx training provides breakout room and testing features. I'm going to show you that. Um, so let's look at the breakout feature. Click the breakout session and assignment and create breakout rooms like team red, blue, green, and assign attendees manually. Uh, you can do it automatically as well. And then when you click the start button, they will jump into the breakout room automatically. This is the you know, host view left side and the breakout room view, attendees view. The host can hop into other breakout rooms to help attendees and the attendees can share content in the breakout room. And last, testing and grading. You can create some tests or pop keys while scheduling and launch them during the session. And also you can score them uh, during the class um, and export the result. Here are some questions I made. Um, first question, what do you think about the movie? And I give it uh, 99 points. And second one is one plus one equal what? And I gave you one point. And when the students submit the test, you can score them individually. And I think this is really nice you know, feature for uh, distance learning. And thank you very much. Abby. It's uh, now time to go over using Zoom at Rutgers. Please remember, if you have questions about anything WebEx, Zoom, or related, uh, use the Q&A button down at the bottom. And David Yates, please take it away. Thank you. Let's go through the basics using Zoom at Rutgers. Similar comparison page. Uh, Zoom has just uh, two tools, meetings and webinar. <clears throat> Almost all of the features that were in the WebEx and WebEx events are also in Zoom. And they're catching up on bells and whistles. WebEx is catching up on Zoom now on the little fun parts that you turn in. And likewise, Zoom is caught up with WebEx on their security features. So very similar applications. Simple meeting with between your department or uh, a few people or a very small class. And especially for patient virtual visits and medical uh, personal information data handling, launch a Zoom meeting or use the Zoom tool in general. And especially if you need interaction between the users, you want to launch a meeting because uh, this way you get uh, almost anybody can share, anybody can do other things, whereas the webinars on the right are much more moderated. Good for your departmental meeting or a very large class where you can't really allow people to pop in and pop out a lot, where you can have someone moderate the questions just like we're doing here, Q&A, run polls. <clears throat> and the package is pretty big, starting at 100 up to 500, all the way to 10,000, depending on how many people need to attend. Similar chart, same features. I think this one has uh, one more Y than the WebEx did. So like I said, they're catching up and the feature comparison pretty close. Uh, only difference in a number of attendees, you can see on the top of our uh, Zoom meeting is a little less than max of WebEx, but should be good for most cases. We'll get another slide on that one in a minute. Uh, otherwise, as far as streaming uh, systems go, it's pretty good. You can accomplish almost any kind of meeting you need to attend. So accounts particulars, <clears throat> we have uh, three different categories of accounts on two different tenants for Zoom. Students and guests who need an account will be able to host a meeting of up to 300 attendees and faculties and staff can invite up to 500 people to their meetings. If you're a guest or if your department has a guest lecturer, you need to sponsor them so they can activate their account via the NetID page as you saw on the previous slide. For the webinars, there is a limited number of licenses available to the university. So it's not a one for one as far as running a webinar in every case. So for now, they request a webinar if you need it through the help desk. 
and they'll assign you a license and they'll increase the number on the day of the event so that you can practice and get everything set up. And they'll increase it up to the biggest one you can need as long as it's scheduled in time. Soon, we're gonna assign the webinars to departmental accounts specifically. So that then the way a department can request one and keep it on there and use it as, as much as they need, except for the very big ones that we're still gonna be in a library where they'll need to be checked out on the day of the event, if it happens to be a 10,000 event or a much bigger one. So regarding the two different instances of accounts, each instance has the same limitations and the same options with a few exceptions in the HIPAA instance. Uh, one thing you have to know, you can't have both and you can't jump back and forth between them. So if you find yourself in a HIPAA account, you can't say, well, I don't wanna be there today because it's based on a policy above us. University puts you in that category because you may be dealing with personal health information. So if you need to launch a Zoom meeting at the time, you, you, you'll wind up in a different instance. Uh, you, you can tell which one you are as soon as you log in, you'll see, oh, I'm in the Rutgers-HIPAA instance. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. And definitely, if you need to interact with patients, you really do have to make sure you're in a HIPAA account before you do. And hopefully everyone lands there automatically who needs to be, but definitely check your meeting links when you start to practice and use Zoom, make sure you land in the right instance so that something doesn't get shared or seen improperly. As far as interfaces go for logging in, you can start here for either account, standard or HIPAA, you can start here, Rutgers.ZoomUS, and you can sign in there. Hit the sign in button and it'll bounce you over to the uh, central authentication service where you enter your net ID and your password. And if it needs to be set up, we'll show you, you can go back to the net ID page. But once you log in there, you'll be able to set up your meetings or launch them from there. Important point is, remember, start at Rutgers.Zoom in either case. You want to go through the SSO login. Don't get to Zoom and type in your email and try to log in or you'll get some kind of error messages that were popping up a lot. Similar if you launch a desktop app, you can download that from Zoom and click on it and launch it and run it. When you get to signing in on there, don't use your email. Use the sign in with SSO button, single sign on. And when you get to the screen that asks you for your company domain, only enter Rutgers. It will direct you ultimately to the proper instance. It's hard to tell looking at the final uh, interface which one you landed in. So it's good to set up a meeting and look for the, make sure you're in the right tenant. From the desktop app, you can launch schedule meetings. And well, share screen doesn't come up in too much, but there's a case where the hardware is in the room and you can click a share screen and pop up the screen on whatever's in the room, if you have a system set up for that. Here's a quick look at the web interface showing you what it would look like once you finally log in. Oh, I landed on a Rutgers.ZoomUS. This is my personal meeting ID and my personal meeting link where I can invite people to an on-the-fly meeting. If I see this one, I know I'm in a standard account. And if I see Rutgers-HIPAA, then I know I landed in here and I can use this meeting for anything that requires the personal health information. Here you see the basic app. It's the same for events or for meetings with just a few little tweaks as far as uh, what shows up on the bottom. If you're an attendee in an event, you don't see all these buttons down here. But if you're the host, you'll see mostly all the same buttons. Important ones, muting your audio on the left, disabling video, and your view options. These are the more important buttons. And up here, you wanna make sure you can get a hold of your meeting information up on the top. We've got a little slide of each one of those. Click the little arrow next to the unmute button, and you can find out which microphone or which speakers you want to use. Very useful 
if you have a headset and you have a laptop that has speakers built in, you probably get better audio occasionally from your uh, headphones. Similar with the video, if you have more than one camera connected to a system for any particular reason, or a, maybe you have a big camera on the wall for a classroom, you want to make sure when you plug in the computer you're using, you pick out the right camera and get it set up. And here is where you find the meeting information. Click on the little arrow up on top. If you got it launched and you realize that someone else needs a link, click up here, copy the URL, and you can see some participant ID. Important to know that if you don't happen to have audio and you need to call in. Once you launch this on your computer or your phone, you want to find your participant ID. So when you call in, you can enter that and be identified correctly over on the list of participants. I think that's about the end. Thank you very much, David. And uh, now we're going to be addressing the WebEx new features. Quick reminder, Q&A, I see them popping up, but please do continue to ask these questions so at the end they can be answered with the Q&A button. And we'll now pass it over to Junio to cover the WebEx new features. Thanks, Avi. Uh, let's start then talking about WebEx new features. And I saw some um, the WebEx training questions on the Q&A box. But after this you know, uh, new features um, session, I think you will give you uh, more uh, details. So there are a couple of nice features in here we have been waiting for. So we are going to you know, look through WebEx 40.8, which just got released this month, and 40.9. 40.8 means it's a version 40 in the month of August, and 40.9, which is coming out next month. 40.8, here are some changes. Grid view by default, no floating self-view, virtual background, music mode, and push to talk. We're going to talk about them soon. 40.9, Cisco changed the user interface a lot, so it looks much easier and clearer. And there is a breakout room for WebEx meetings. As you know, breakout room is only for WebEx training, but now it will merge down to WebEx meetings. And broadcast message, which is a part of breakout room feature, and co-host, and we will talk about uh, Canvas integration. So first, grid view. When you join the WebEx meetings, you will see the grid view by default because that was one of the biggest requests from everyone. Grid view is very popular and good for instructors because they can see all participants in the meeting. It will scale up to 25 on a single window. And a nice feature for grid view is actually you can hide participants that don't have video. If you don't wanna waste your grid view with people who haven't turned on their video, click the hide participants button to you get more you know, video focused. And don't worry about other layouts because Cisco doesn't take away any other layouts. So if you want, you can still flip back to active and thumbnail or active speaker video layout. And also your self view will be part of the grid view. If you like the old view, again, the new version doesn't take anything away. So you can take yourself out and see yourself on a floating window, and you can put it back into the grid view again. Uh, virtual background is really popular on Zoom, and finally, we'll be able to change the virtual background on WebEx. Uh, as you can see, there are three virtual backgrounds and filter which makes your background blurry. Also, you can upload your custom backgrounds this is only for WebEx meetings and WebEx event. And music mode. I think one of the most interesting feature is music mode. In the WebEx platform, Cisco updated new generation audio and video codecs. So from audio perspective, you will get much better and higher audio quality. When you turn on the music mode, it's actually gonna enable a wider band audio codec so if you play an instrument or music, you'll provide a richer audio experience. And it's gonna turn off audio filters like 
noise reduction, which reduces background noise on or non-human voice. And also, you might feel you might feel that when two people are talking at the same time, the one person voice volume went down because of the noise reduction. But when you turn on the music mode, it will turn off these audio filters. And also, it provides really, really low latency mode, which will allow for better audio collaboration. So for example, with, without the music mode, if I say, hey, David and Avi, please sing uh, together, and I will count to three, then I might hear Avi's voice first than David because Avi has a better internet connection. But when you turn on the music mode, it will reduce the audio latency so that you can expect to hear Avi and David's voice at the same time. And push to talk. One of the other favorite features I found is push to talk. So you are on mute and you don't like to fumble around the mute button and you don't know if you click the mute button or not. If you simply hold the space bar and it will actually show a video indicator on your screen that you are temporarily unmuted with a beep sound. As long as you hold the space bar, you are unmuted. And if you let go of the space bar, it will remute you automatically. I think it is a fast, simple, easy way to handle and deal with muting so you won't run into problem around open microphone or barking you know, dogs, people going to bathroom. All those fun things will never happen on your call. And 40.9, new user interface. I heard that Cisco got a ton of complaints about people not knowing if the button worked and they kept disappearing. So if you didn't move your computer mouse, all the, your buttons disappear. So video, audio, contents, recording are not there and they're not visible all the time. So Cisco moved all the buttons down to the bottom and gave them text labels and they are always visible. And also, as you can see, um, here, the current WebEx buttons are really simple, mute, unmute, and video, and content. But the problem is that uh, all of the important options are hidden in here, the three dots. But the new user interface will give you more options with the tiny arrow on the bottom here. So if you have multiple microphones and cameras, like uh, one external webcam and another one, on your laptop screen. Uh, in the current WebEx, you have to click the three dots and go to the audio setting and find the microphone you want to use. Go to the video, choose the camera that you'd like to use and hit save. If you need to change them, you have to do the same thing again. But this new user interface is more user friendly. So you can simply click the arrow and see all the microphones and cameras you have set. So you can easily find the microphone and camera you want to use. Breakout room. This is the feature only for WebEx training, but from the version 40.9, you, you can create breakout room during the WebEx meetings. When you click the breakout room button, it will tell you how many people you have available to sign to breakout room, just like, just like WebEx training. When you go to the breakout room, you still have your video and audio. This is a huge change, I think, because the current WebEx training breakout room sessions, there's no video. It's only audio uh, content, but now you can see video as well. Next, broadcast message. You can send a broadcast message to participants in the breakout room. For example, hey guys, a breakout room's gonna end in five minutes. Or if you need any help, please click ask for help button. So you can send a notification to uh, everyone. And co-host. Co-host is a more powerful role than the panelist. When you have a large meeting, the host will be very busy and needs some support. Um, in this case, you can assign a co-host and he or she will support the meeting. For example, panelists cannot change their role, right? Only the, co only the host can change it. But think about it, you ask the you know, host if he can change the role, 
but the host got stuck in the something and he has no time, then co-host can change their role on behalf of the host. And only host and polling manager can manage the polls, but now co-host can create and start the polls as well. So your meeting will be much smoother. And Canvas integration with WebEx. Uh, you can schedule WebEx meetings on Canvas and you should post it on the class calendar manually. So the students will go to the class calendar on Canvas and uh, check the time and join the class. And one of the amazing part is that, let me change my slide. You don't have to generate the registration and attendees list for uh, grading, the attendance grading. I saw some uh, users requested the list for grading, but now Canvas will provide you with attendance grading. So it will make you uh, more um, easy to grade the attendance. All right, thank you very much, Neil. Uh, we're gonna be talking about some of the new Zoom features that are coming and what we're rolling out to the general public. Please remember to use the Q&A button down. We've got a bunch of questions and we're looking forward to even more. So take it away, David. Okay, Zoom features. As we saw, uh, quite similar to what WebEx is rolling out because they are catching up. We tried to highlight a couple of the important ones, especially that we noticed people are coming into as they're getting started with Zoom. Click on here, let's roll through. Famous virtual background. How do I change mine so I get a really gorgeous Rutgers background? When you get to Zoom account and set it up, down by the video, click on the choose virtual background button and you should be able to see plenty of choices. Um, we, uh, they're, they're already in there, many of the Rutgers backgrounds, and we'll have them available uh, along with the presentations and links to the others. If they're not in your account, you can contact us. We'll send them over to you. Very popular feature. Uh, as you can see, we all decided to team up on our presentation today. And screen sharing. Everyone has to do that during a conference, seems like. So click the little button down below, screen share, and you're gonna have an opportunity to uh, pick a, a whole desktop, depending on what you wanna share, or create a little whiteboard so everybody can scratch up on there and share ideas. You can pick a particular application if that's the one you want to share. And it'll be the, it's good to full screen the application if you can, or it sort of pops up in a small area on a black screen. So presentations and slideshows, it's a pretty convenient and useful. Most cases, anybody can share, but there's ways to affect that. There's a little slide of that later on. Uh, once you start sharing something, you're gonna see something change. The toolbar pops up to the top, you left the bottom of the screen down below and rolls up here. And now you have to look up here for any meeting controls that you need to affect or accomplish. Click your stop share button up here when you're done. And somewhat a popular one now and then is uh, the annotation button. I just blew that up to make it a little bit clearer. If you have the opportunities, you click the little annotation button there and then uh, it pops up on the side. And you can uh, pick one of the tools or type something inside there and start scratching on the drawing. Gives you a good opportunity to share notes or emphasize something during a presentation at a lecture and get ideas and input from the others on the meeting. Click stop share when you're done. So Zoom security, there's a, they had a big run around at the end of the year because suddenly everyone was going virtual and Zoom got in the news a lot because of bombers, it became a kind of term, invading someone's meeting so we spent a little time here trying to help you avoid that. It's disruptive. And unfortunately there's robots out there who are looking for your meeting. And when they find it, they hand it off to some bad person who's being criminal and trying to invade you. So a couple of options to help you 
have a very convenient and comfortable meeting, what to do before and what to do during the meeting. Now, all of these are sort of increasing in level and they can be sometimes not practical. So you gotta do a test or two and figure out what works for you. Pretty, pretty easy one, don't use your personal room when you set up a meeting because your personal room meeting ID doesn't change. So if you invite someone to it and they decide they don't like you in a year or so, they'll go hit that meeting once a few times a day and try to bomb you because now they know, oh, I know where that guy's personal meeting is. So if you're gonna host a meeting or a class, it's probably good to generate an automatic, a new uh, meeting ID each time. This way it's harder for robots to find you. Require a meeting password, that's a given. Because if you don't have a password, anybody with any link can click on it and they're suddenly in your meeting. Uh, as long as the people who you want get the email from the meeting, they'll have the password built in so it's not so difficult for them. And they'll be able to see it if they need to call on the phone. It's a pretty easy way and it should be, it is required, don't ever uncheck that box. Basically policy should say, don't ever be able to turn that off. Most simple and easiest way to get it, a safer meeting. Next is use your waiting room. Very good feature, but maybe not so good for a big giant class. What happens is people click the link, they pop up there and as long as the meeting's running, you see a little notification on the bottom of the window that says someone's in your waiting room. So you need to go up there and click it and let them in. Gives you a chance to screen the people coming in. If there is a bomber or a name you didn't know, something strange, you can ignore that person, leave them out. Join before host disabled. By default that's on, but it's uh, depending how many people you're inviting. If it's a big meeting, you uncheck that box and then when they get there, they just see a window waiting for the host to join. Uh, otherwise, everyone can join the meeting ahead of time as long as they have their links. And maybe they can conduct a meeting without you, uh, which could be not so good. For a super secure, you turn on authenticated users only. This way, only people with an account on your Zoom instance can join your meeting. They'll have to go to the SSO login page or be already logged into their Zoom app when they click on the meeting uh, invite. It's a more extreme case, which would restrict it pretty much to anybody at the university. It may, it may I don't know, it, it's, I, I'd say the extreme case, but very secure is because that way only the people you know who belong in there are gonna be in there. <clears throat> During the meeting, what can you do? Once you know everybody's in there, click on the uh, security tab and you see lock meeting. That's a, pretty simple, easy feature. You know, we're all here and we don't want anybody invading us, just lock it up. Anyone who shows up then will just get a note, the meeting's locked, sorry. Or you can enable the waiting room if somebody's running late. That way you'll be able to screen them. You can do these afterwards if you didn't set it up uh, when the meeting was enabled, uh, being scheduled. Next, uh, depending on if something's going wrong and you notice someone's muted or unmuted, as you can see, you can control them up there if you need to hear them or make them quiet. Also, if you find out that they happen to be in the wrong meeting, it can even be innocent. It's been cases where you schedule the meeting and send someone an invite and they're on the wrong calendar day and they clicked it and they landed in your meeting room because you used a personal meeting room and they met a bunch of people who weren't supposed, who weren't in the meeting they were expecting. Definitely happens. Uh, the host can click on the uh, individual participant, remove them if they don't belong there, bounce them into the waiting room if they need to be. Uh, if you end up with a bomber in your meeting and you have to send them out, you do remove them right away, run over to the, to the lock button that I showed you and go ahead and lock the meeting because they're gonna just try to come back and cause more troubles. Simple, easy feature. Um, depending on what's going on, you may want to hard mute everybody, so to speak. There is a mute all button down here where everybody just suddenly can't talk except for you. And you can go a little further in the advanced button and 
prevent people from unmuting themselves if there's a lot of background noise in a really big class and people just aren't able to communicate back and forth that you have an issue. It's a good feature to have. And uh, sharing preventing. If a bomber can't talk, they may send up some data that could be quite inappropriate. So you can sometimes, if you need to, turn off sharing for others and only whoever is hosting can share the presentation. If it needs to be one presentation and you need to pass off control to someone, you, there's a, an option for that too. Scheduling. Uh, these are, we found four or five, we found five interfaces right now where we can schedule that are supported. Uh, I showed a brief picture of the app version on the left earlier. Click on there and they have a, basically all the same options inside them. The web UI is on the right. Once you sign in there, you pick all the features you need, set the settings. Here you have an issue that when you set up here, it's not gonna allow you to invite everybody. On the web and in the app, you can invite a co-host to your meeting, but you cannot invite the whole class because there's no way to import all the addresses. So uh, what I'm saying is Zoom is not gonna email everybody the way WebEx did. So if you set up the meeting here, you'll see a button when you're done, it says add to your calendar. And there on your calendar after that, you can add everybody to it or you can download the application, you download the invite from the web interface and then forward that from your email program. You can do it from Canvas. Once you click on the course and open up in Zoom, same features or same uh, selections are available. Pick them all, hit save, then it pops on the class calendar over there and you should get a message in your inbox saying that it's all done. So that one's ready to go. I think it's launching next week. For others, uh, the other supported function right now is to set them up with the Office 365 add-in. Memorize add-in when you're looking for this. It shows up in your desktop outlook up here in the toolbar with a couple of buttons. And it's also available in the O365 interface. I'll show the basic setup on O365. Uh, if you roll up to the little three buttons there and find, scroll down and find Zoom, you can add your Zoom meeting over there. And if you haven't been logged in, it's gonna prompt you to log in. Here you wanna enter Rutgers, like I said, click continue and it'll bounce you over to CAS so that you can finish logging in. And from there, you should be able to scroll back and uh, add a Zoom meeting. It'll pop all the information down in there, basically as soon as you log in. You may need to change some of that. So you scroll back up to a little uh, three ball button Pick on the settings tab right over here. And you'll see the same panel that you see showed up in the Outlook version right now. Really all you need to do there is scroll up and down and find out what you need to set on there. And then you need to click the update button so that all the Zoom information you changed, for instance, this one shows adding a co-host. You wanna make sure all the information you changed gets sent back up to the uh, Zoom service. And it's the same, unfortunately, for when you change something on the Outlook calendar. If you change the time on either one of these, you need to open up the Zoom app and click update. Because you may change the meeting day, but Zoom won't know that. It'll still be set up till the, day, the original date until you open up it in the tool and click update. This can be a little more convenient because now you can find all the people you wanted to invite through your, your contact page or through the university directories. I like this one better than just doing it on the web. Um, for the few cases where it didn't show up, you didn't see the toolbar up here on, on your uh, Outlook or you didn't see it up in the ball, you may have to scroll into the get add-in feature. 
and then look in the we call the admin manage section. You shouldn't have to actually download much, but just turn it on in this case. So if you find yourself at Zoom looking for some link to follow and turn this thing on, you're in the wrong place. Go to O365, click on the little uh, ball and look for the Zoom that you need to set up. And then it's gonna turn on for you over there. Next, standard accounts versus HIPAA accounts. Uh, you don't need to be in either one to join any meeting. If you're a professor and you have a HIPAA account and some students are in your class who are not HIPAA students, they can still join your meeting. But, and likewise, you know, if you're a HIPAA, having to be a HIPAA student, you can join a class that's not in the HIPAA account. <clears throat> but there are some differences, minor differences, but turned out to be very important differences between scheduling on behalf of others and attendance reports. Now, just remember, if you click the thing, uh, to set up your account, you're going to land in one or the other. So when you host your meeting, you want to know that you can still invite anybody, but you can't have them co-host your meeting unless they're in your same tenant, and you can't schedule for them if they're in different tenants. We understand there's been an abundance of reported concerns with the existing HIPAA tenant. Please understand, today's presentation is reflective of the existing implementation, but we can assure you the concerns are being reviewed. So scheduling on behalf of others. If you are trying to schedule a meeting for someone else, they want to delegate you the authority. They need to be in the same tenant that you're in. And you need your own account in the same tenant. HIPAA should schedule, HIPAA admin can schedule meetings for a HIPAA lecturer. Standard accounts can schedule meetings for standard accounts. You just can't mix them up. And reports. You like to, a lot of people like to go back and find out who was in the meeting for attendance purposes. <clears throat> it's all in there if you log into Zoom on the web. You can't find these in the app on your desktop, but when you log into the web, there is a report button and you click on there and you can find out who was in your meetings, scroll a couple clicks over if you're in the standard tenant. If you find yourself in a HIPAA tenant, the names are not shown because they're not supposed to be shown because that's personal information that's not supposed to be revealed or stored somewhere other than the right where you can store it yourself. So <clears throat> you give a little issue when it comes to attendance, especially. It was popular to finish the meeting and then go back later and download the report. <clears throat> it can be a problem in this case. So we found that the Canvas roll call will work if you're setting up meetings in there. Good for there. If you have the poll or chat turned on, you can take attendance through there. It's kind of a low budget way. Pretty easy. People can just say something. <clears throat> or old school interactive analog roll call and find out who's in the meeting. Recording. If you're in a standard account, you can record meetings to the cloud. If you're in a HIPAA account, you can only record meetings down to your desktop because there's no way for Zoom to find out what's going across the wire because everything's encrypted between each and every client. Plain and simple, you just won't be able to record to the cloud if you're launching a HIPAA meeting. There's, a, there's good for both. It, it's a cut out a step of getting the things up to a translator such as Kaltura or something like that if you need to run the uh, the transcription service. But local local recording has failed in the past on both services just because PC issues sometimes get a glitch and they use up memory and then suddenly oh rats my recording's botched. <clears throat> if it's in the cloud it's a little bit more convenient. Maybe you can get help with Zoom support to check in issues but if it's local, there's not much one can do if the recording got botched. Third party applications, I've mentioned in the beginning, <clears throat> very popular, a lot of them existing in there, integrating and allowing you to uh, like schedule like you can do in Canvas. LTI is the one that turned on Canvas. So if you're searching through there and you know your department's using a 
particular application for scheduling or other things like that. Uh, if you look through there and you see that the app you want to use is created by Zoom, then you're okay. Contact the ITC or help desk and we'll schedule time to help it turn it on for you. If it's not made by Zoom, it's got to go through a third party vendor risk assessment. And so it, let us know. We'll give you back the information how to get it set up. The best criteria on top of those is if the application is going to try to take over the whole instance of Zoom. For instance, some request a specific recording service, which would unfortunately direct everybody's recording from every account into that particular service. So the best app, best chance of getting an app turned on is that it's only going to be applicable to individual users when they go and specifically turn it on. That's about all there is to it as far as the applications go. Thank you very much, David. And now I'm up to talk about what's coming next. Please remember that if you have any questions, we can certainly answer them. There have been a bunch asked and the Q&A portion is coming up after this section. So we wanted to talk about the fall enhancements. These are things that are coming and or on campus or in the cloud that will improve the user experience for everyone. Please remember that WebEx and Zoom are continually improving. There is no status quo for this. As both, Zoom, as both David and Junil were talking about, these are new features as these applications are actually growing closer and closer together. So update your clients often and you'll see these new features coming in. And these client updates are happening at least once a month, if not sooner. This is for both the new features and security because they're constantly having tested that security against everyone in the world who wants to be either a Zoom bomber or get into your WebEx meeting. Things like filters, backgrounds, breakout rooms, they're all coming in WebEx and those are the future releases that you can look forward to, but we do have to always be conscious of security. On campus, we're currently running a Cisco technology called Video Mesh, which enables 1080p video for folks that are on campus using WebEx. We are actually in the alpha of doing the same for Zoom. So these are some of the things that you can look forward to coming up in the fall to help for our bifurcated educational initiative. Along with that, we have the classroom of the future. Now, this is being rolled out slowly. You can't expect to see this everywhere in the fall, but we're transitioning from only hardware codecs to software and hardware codecs. What that means is before you had a dedicated piece of hardware that was designed to work with WebEx or designed to work with Zoom, or even designed to work with Microsoft Teams. But going forward, we're going to try and use more software based or computers so that with these USB based solutions that you see on the screen, all of them are USB, just plug and chug. They will actually work with all three of these services just like a webcam would. These are hybrid learning solutions so that the professors who are coming in to teach will be able to do so and address the people that are in location as well as the vast majority of the students who will be remote. This is a low cost solution and it's going to be simple so that it is the interfaces that you're used to using or professors are used to using and you're used to supporting remotely. And as I said, this is going to be phased in and there may be different options. Camden may choose a different option for a USB camera than you will actually get with the folks in New Brunswick. DCS may have a slightly different standard than what you have for a particular department. So right now, please be aware, you may see these three devices or others, but they will all behave like USB cameras so you won't actually 
have to worry about it. It will be the same interface that you're used to. Now, we get this a lot, which are questions about how can you have a quality meeting while you're remote? I'm sitting here in my house today rather than in a conference room and addressing things. So how can I actually have a good meeting experience? And here we're going to get a little bit technical. Zoom, WebEx, and Microsoft Teams are roughly the same in terms of the needs for bandwidth, which is how wide your internet pipe is and much water is flowing through it at one time. And in terms of connectivity, people talk about it in terms of megabytes per second or megabits per second up and down. The rule of thumb is you need about 12 megabits per second up and down for one of these people's meetings going on at the same time. Now we have some locations where we have two professors in a home. That would mean you need 12 megabits per second up and down per person, 24 total, for them to have a good experience. We also recommend that you have wired connections to your router. Wireless does work and it works fine, but you need to have good QoS, you need to have enough bandwidth, and you don't want to be running something in the house. Let's say your uh, son, daughter is there, and they're watching Netflix at 4K while you're trying to actually conduct a meeting. Not necessarily the best experience as it could eat up all that bandwidth that you need for the meeting. Now, we do have a link here so you can set up the best security for this as well, because as we've talked about, security is always a concern. And then we also get asked, what do you recommend? What is the best for people to use for certain situations? So here are a few that we'll just go over. And please, if you've got more, you can ask in the Q&A. I see it being very popular already, that Q&A. So Zoom right now has breakout rooms with video. Use it. Next month, we can anticipate WebEx to have the same thing, but Zoom is here now. Conversely, the Zoom versus WebEx webinars, for WebEx, everybody gets access to WebEx events right now. If you have a WebEx account, you have WebEx events. That means you can hold a webinar through WebEx events that's more limited for Zoom. So there may be contention, especially for the larger meetings. Now, we always talk about going to conferences and I was scheduled to go to one that was canceled in June, but now with these services, be it WebEx events or the Zoom webinars, you can actually conference without masks because last point, streaming is available in both of these applications. This will allow you to increase your reach so that you can actually have a live stream going out through a WebEx meeting, a WebEx event, or a Zoom webinar so that you're not actually listening to, limited to the number of participants that you have, but you actually can expand your reach as far as possible. Now, I know there are 23 questions that I may have to answer in addition to the ones that we have right here, but I just want to go over some of the top questions that we have. Again, the Q&A button, if you have anything that has occurred to you throughout this entire talk, and I'll be happy to answer them in short order. First is Zoom help. It's different than WebEx. For WebEx, you can actually pick up the phone and call WebEx, and they will help you. For Zoom, we recommend you first ask your local IT professional and then either consult the community webpage that is for Zoom, they have extensive documentation, or call the help desk. They stand ready to assist you. But you can't call Zoom like you would call WebEx. Activating your account has been gone over in this presentation, but we certainly have links for that in the latter part of these slides. But you do go to netid.ruckers.edu and go to activate services and then click on which one you want and you should have it. 
scheduling on behalf of is something that David has covered. It is actually the same in WebEx, and you can grant the rights to anyone at Rutgers within your tenant. There's only one tenant for WebEx, and that's anyone. And Zoom, you have to be respective of whether you're on the HIPAA tenant or on the main tenant. The departmental accounts, I know we've gotten a lot of questions about these. We're hoping by the end of this month, we'll have them out and you will actually be able to log into them. Unlike what we have implemented for WebEx, we're in talks with the various groups in the university to provide an ability to have a shared password and then duo two-factor authentication so that it will actually go to your particular phone and authenticate you to log into that Zoom account. So that way you can actually use them as if they were your own accounts. The O365 plugins, that's what David had gone over. Please remember to go to the get add-ons portion and then the administered add-ons are where you'd find those two that will install natively into your O365 instance. And then they will flow down to any desktop applications that you have. So be aware if you have the plugin for your desktop that you downloaded and installed, you'll get two sets of buttons. You should uninstall the one that you downloaded and just use the one that is coming through O365. Now, here's one that can cause a bit of consternation. Can you host more than one meeting at the same time? The answer is no, you can't. And that's why we're actually rolling out departmental accounts so that if there's a need for more than one meeting at the same time, you can use those departmental accounts to host them. And you can have a couple or maybe even more departmental accounts to satisfy those needs. In terms of breakout rooms, no, you can't have sub breakout rooms. They're just one set of breakout rooms and people can't move between them. A host or a co-host can move between them, but the individual people cannot. Now, we've been getting a lot of notifications from our user base that they're getting emails about people waiting in their room for them to join. As David went over, that is a security issue. And those are people that are constantly scanning and trying to get into their waiting rooms. As a result, next point, all Zoom personal rooms, PMIs, are now required to have passwords. The communication has gone out, an alert has gone out for this. If you go into the settings and check, you'll see that it is now actually live and active. So you can set those passwords to wherever you want. Please remember, those passwords are static. So that means that if you're using a personal room for a class, which is certainly not recommended, all those students will have that password. And if you don't change it next semester, all the other students will still have the password that you used for last semester and that can lead to issues. So with that, I would like to bring Mike in here so he can ask me some of the questions that you've had in the Q&A and I can respond to them. All right, thanks so much, Avi. All right, so um, Liz and I are gonna alternate just asking the questions that we did not answer already via text, so we will start. So David Tran asked, for the WebEx and Zoom integration in Canvas, I believe WebEx integration was done a few days ago, but is the Zoom integration still set for the 17th? Correct. Actually, the WebEx integration will go live tomorrow. There was a bit of timing kerfuffle about the announcements, so that'll go live tomorrow, and then the Zoom integration is set for the 17th. Joy asks, we have many classes over 100 students. Will the Canvas migration take care of the webinar need? Again, uh, the standard account for all professors who should be hosting these meetings will be 500. So for that's the minimum size that you'll get. So if you're using Zoom, 500. If you're using WebEx, it's 1,000 people in that particular meeting. You shouldn't have to use webinars for classes at all. 
All right, uh, user BV Ward asked, will Zoom replace Big Blue Button and Canvas? I can't say that it will. Right now, we're actually looking for agility when it comes to the applications that we're rolling out in Canvas. We want people to be able to use them. Listen, fall's coming. We know that a lot of K through 12 schools are gonna be going online with these services. And while we would hope that everything will go flawlessly, we know there may be problems. And if there are problems, we want you to have access to all of these tools so you can actually use the best one, not only for teaching, but what's available at that time. So I can't say anything is going away. We're just adding to your portfolio so you will be able to use what you deem is best and what is available at the time. Our next question is, can Zoom or WebEx be used for nonprofit organization meetings? Right now, we are going with the acceptable use policy of the university. And so if that is accepted within the acceptable use policy, sorry for using the word accepted twice, then that's just fine. Other than that, we would want you to use it for Rutgers business. All right, we had another user ask the question, where can we find the Rutgers background for your WebEx video? Um, they're actually in there now. If you don't see them, please update your client. We've actually had some problems where folks haven't seen the backgrounds that we rolled out administratively, but I believe there are seven or eight of them now, various Rutgers, Reds, uh, the Word, the R, and a couple pictures that we actually have had vetted that are fully available for you to use. The next question is, how do we update to 40.9 in WebEx Training Center? WebEx Training Center is a little different than meetings and events. So 40.9 is the actual release that will be coming out in September. So there is an early access that we can let people see it, but you can't use it in production. If you need to prep training materials, that's just fine. We'll be happy to give you access to it. And that's on 40.8 and 40.9 will be here momentarily. But what they're planning on doing with WebEx is moving more and more of the features that are in Training Center into Meeting and Event Center. And eventually, not now, I'll say this again, not now, depreciating Training Center in favor of Meeting and Event Center. So you'll see more and more of those features rolling into Meeting Center and in Event Center. So Training Center won't be getting those updates. It's much more of Meeting Center and Event Center. All right, our next question was, if either of these platforms allowed you to delete a post in the chat, this user runs programs for high school age students and would benefit from the ability to delete inappropriate comments. I don't know, and I'd have to get back to you on that one. Um, I think everything is up there forever, but we can certainly look into integrations if that is necessary for your business model, and we'd have to get them vetted and go from there. So if Liz or Mike can take note of who you are, we can certainly do some research and get back to you. Our next question is, how do you give someone else the annotation ability? Ah, in Zoom, if you right click on the name, you'll actually see a bunch of roles that you can assign to the person and annotation, closed captioning, et cetera, et cetera, are there. However, remember, annotation is a subsection of the presenter's role. So it's probably bonded there that you have to give them the ability to present and then annotate. I don't know if it can be separated, but we can certainly look into it and then post it up in our FAQs if we find anything different. All right, our next question came from James Hartstein, who said, in one of the slides, it showed that WebEx allows for streaming to Facebook and other services. Is this live for the Rutgers version of WebEx? Yes, it is. However, we would ask that you submit all of your requests to do this to the help desk, because we would like to allow you to do this as one-offs rather than roll it out for everyone 
all the time. Um, there are branding concerns that have us restrict that from individual users to do it, but you can go through an approval process and then stream whatever meeting or event you would like, and we can enable it for that and then remove it when it's done. Was this presentation only intended for IT people or were non-IT people invited as well? This was in, this invitation was supposed to go out for IT and non-IT people. And we tried to actually have a bunch of detailed content that would address specific user questions, concerns, or, and tell them about new features, as well as for the IT folks to tell them what to expect both now and coming forward. All right, the next question was, can the waiting room be enabled for personal room meetings? For example, for virtual office hours, where you might only want one person in the room at a time while others wait to come in when you're done with your current person. Absolutely, it just depends on how you set up the meeting uh, when you're scheduling it, and then you can, I believe, enable it when you're actually in the meeting if you'd like. So, sure, just set it up that way. Can you show us or discuss what the Zoom integration in Canvas will look like? Will meetings have to be set up through the Zoom account, or will they be able to be set up directly through Canvas for class sessions? The first part, no. The second part, I'll absolutely answer. So, in Canvas, Zoom will let you schedule natively. So you will go in, as was shown earlier in the presentation, and schedule a meeting within Canvas. And once you schedule it within Canvas, it will actually propagate to the calendar in Canvas, as well as be in the classroom for a list of meetings. Now, when it is on the calendar, as we have heard, is very useful for all the students because that's what they actually check. Then they can just click on the link and join. And depending on how you set up that meeting, whether it's for authenticated users or not, they can either join with the link with the password embedded in it by default, or you can actually have them log in and then go from there. So yes, everything should be baked into Canvas for scheduling meetings through Zoom. All right, and the next question is similar. The user asks, for the Zoom integration with Canvas, if you have multiple classes, would scheduled meetings made in one class appear in any other class? No. So all of those meetings are associated with the user and the class. So they should only appear on the class's calendar. Now, you or whoever the professor actually was would be able to go into Zoom and get a list of all the meetings but they're segregated per class in Canvas. Will you be able to set all the same settings in the Canvas Zoom integration that you can through the web? In particular, can you set the recording to include transcription by default? Not all of the options are available in Canvas. It's a limited subset of options. So I don't know about that one in particular, but Liz and Mike can make a note of it, and I can certainly follow up with you for an answer. The Rutgers.zoom.us URL is not static. I have to log in every time. Can that be sticky? Rutgers.zoom.us, the portal, actually will take you to the SSO login. So that means that if you're having to log in every time, it may be something with the cookies related to SSO rather than something actually with the Zoom portal itself. So I would check how you're handling cookies on your browser to actually alleviate that concern. Um, if you wanna do some additional testing, please reach out to EITC at OIT or the help desk and we'll be happy to do so. Andrew asked, has anyone else experienced that Zoom breakout rooms are unstable if participants join with the web client? That I don't know, but we certainly can do some tests and find out for you. Um, again, Zoom is a relatively new product for us, so we'll have to do some additional testing and get back to you. 
All right, our next question comes from Brian and he asked, can it Zoom meetings or WebEx, meet, WebEx meetings administer exams or can that only be done through WebEx training? You can actually use polls to emulate that behavior, but WebEx training currently has the only way to administer exams at this time. Now, remember, they're trying to move more of the features for training into meetings as well as events. So that may be coming in the future, but I haven't heard about it right now. For Zoom, do you have the opportunity to add a redirect to another web page at the end of the session like you do with a Qualtrics survey? If you're using events or the webinar, the answer is yes, you can. And then they will be delivered automatically to that at the end of the event or webinar. All right, Felix asked, if you are in a non-HIPAA department but deal with lots of possible other sensitive data such as SSNs, is a regular Zoom account secure enough or should a request be made to have the users be marked PHIY to provide a more secure environment? This is a bit out of my scope. However, my opinion would be those folks should be flagged. And we don't handle flagging. So let me speak to that just for a moment in here. I can't alter anyone's flag as an administrator. And flagging is how we sort users between the HIPAA and the main Zoom instance. We know this is an area of concern and there are folks that may need the flag that are not flagged and that may be flagged that don't need the flag. But again, we're just sorting based on the flag as a whole. And we need to either have a better way of flagging or address these concerns in another manner as has been alluded to earlier in the session. We hear you loud and clear that the sorting method that we have used is very broad and we either need finer sorting or to address this concern in general. Can you play music in the background in Zoom? If so, can you adjust the volume of the music so the speaker's voice is heard on top of the music? Absolutely. So within Zoom, there's a way to share audio as well as from your computer, as well as use the microphone. So that would be how you do it. And then I know from experience that you can adjust the various sliders for volume from various applications, and therefore you can play volume at various levels. So yes, on a PC, absolutely. Someone else would have to answer on a Mac. Okay, the next question is, I use a shared account to schedule some WebEx trainings. I'm not able to run the attendance reports myself and I have to contact the help desk. Will that change? Yes. We don't want to run reports for you. We would much rather have you run those reports. So along with Zoom and the way that we're actually letting you log into those accounts, we would love to be able to transition all of the current WebEx shared accounts to that exact infrastructure. And we are planning to do so. Again, it's right before the beginning of the semester <clears throat> and we don't want to make large changes right now but that is on our roadmap and hopefully by winter, we can address both Zoom shared accounts and WebEx shared accounts so that everybody can log in and become those accounts. Now becoming is a technical term, but it basically means I'm logging in with my NetID and my password. And when I do, I choose to become a shared account. So that way I can use the web GUI as if I was that account. And that would allow you to run all of the reports that you would natively run from an account, download all of the shared content and address that concern. 
In Zoom, is it possible to stream a participant's camera quality higher than 640 by 360? I haven't noticed a higher quality in Rutgers.Zoom.us hosted meeting. Zoom, we haven't rolled out the technology to do HD. And so as of right now, we're reliant upon the web bridging. And so the answer is no. Uh, we have to wait for Zoom as a software, as a service in the cloud to actually roll out higher definition video. And if we can actually do something for the folks who are on campus, that's something we're aimed to do in the fall. Remember, HD is not necessarily 1080p, that would be 720p. We're looking into it now, but there are a few gotchas that we need to work out technically before we can make it live. All right, our next question comes from Emily, and she said, many professors are eager to use Zoom in Canvas, but the requirement that the primary email in Canvas must be NetID at Rutgers makes this almost impossible for many. If a user has been using a different address in Canvas, then all of their LTI accounts like VoiceThread, PlayPosit, Flipgrid, Hypothesis, and most publisher integrations will be broken. Can OIT change the decision to require only NetID at Rutgers.edu accounts for the Canvas Zoom integration? Not at this time. Right now, all accounts in Zoom are known as NetID at Rutgers.edu. For the Zoom integration to actually work with Canvas, you need to have an agreement in Canvas with your email address and what Zoom knows you as. So not at this time. What kind of security is available on the recordings? Depends on the product. So I guess I'll answer both. So when you're actually recording in WebEx, they're actually password protected and or encrypted when they're in the cloud. The same thing is true for the encryption at rest in the Zoom cloud. I don't know of passwords on Zoom. I haven't investigated that, honestly. And then within the HIPAA tenant, you can only store things locally. So that would be a recording that is actually on your own computer. All right, our next question comes from Gordon and it's when can we expect communications about the conversion of existing Zoom accounts, standard and webinar? Soon, TM. So we're actually working on this with Zoom actively and we want to uh, move the first few accounts in a test batch ASAP. And then once we've got that done, we'll move everyone in mass over. So plans are still being worked out and bugs keep popping up. So we wanna make sure this conversion is done as cleanly as possible for everyone. And that way, not only can we uh, address the folks that would be falling from a paid Zoom account to a free Zoom account, but allow them to work within the system centrally. So the only answer I can give you right now is soon. And yes, we do hear you. Yes, we wanted to move a whole bunch of people even last night, but we ran into a technical snag. And so that has to be pushed out slightly. So as soon as we can get that done, we will be communicating. Can we record a meeting as a guest in both platforms? No. So in WebEx, you need to be a host or soon to be co-host to be able to record a meeting. In Zoom, you are able to grant the ability to record a meeting to a participant. Please remember, if you are logged in as a participant, you may be able to do it as a cloud recording if you're not on the HIPAA tenant. But most of the time it will be a local recording for the participant to record. All right, Sue asked if we could post the comparison matrix link in the chat. Absolutely. So if Mike or Liz can do that, I'd be happy to, it's actually on my next slide. So thank you for helping me transition. Oh, actually let me go through here to these slides here. And these are all of the links that are available. This will be a published document, but if you want to copy and paste this link going out, then I'll be happy to have them provide that for you. 
WebEx currently has integration with the Rutgers directory when adding attendees to a meeting through the web interface. Will Zoom's website also have that set up as well for adding alternate hosts or other areas where invites can be added to a Zoom meeting? Ah, okay, so in terms of alternate hosts, Zoom's works very differently than WebEx. So when you're actually adding the alternate hosts for WebEx, it reads it directly from the attendee list. So you just have to check a box. And if you're using an email address that is recognized by WebEx, then you can add them as an alternate host. Zoom doesn't automatically read that line in your Outlook. So that means you have to manually type them in when you go into settings, advanced, and then down to the very bottom to find the bar where you can add those email addresses. Please remember those email addresses need to be added in as netid at ruckers.edu for Zoom to recognize them. That's not something that we at Rutgers control. This is a cloud to cloud type um, add in. And so if Zoom does add in the enhancement to their O365 plugin to automatically read, then we should have the same functionality. But right now, it's not something we can control. Can you save chats, question and answers, and whiteboards in Zoom like you can in WebEx? They should be part of those recordings. And yes, there is a save as. Why do we need shared WebEx accounts? Um, we went through such an ordeal to recreate our shared accounts and there doesn't seem to be a use case. I'll give you a very simple one. Um, any department that wants to run an event that's not as an individual person. So Office of the President versus Dr. Holloway or Jonathan. And we also have large events that are run by Rutgers all the time that are hosted on behalf of the event or the department where a person's name would be inappropriate to actually have on that event. For our next question, would it be possible for you to just reiterate which platforms currently will have breakout rooms and which are coming soon? Sure. Zoom has them now. WebEx will get them next month. WebEx Training Center currently has breakout rooms, but they don't have video in those breakout rooms. That's why Zoom breakout rooms are more popular. Next month, they're going to be rolling out video-centric breakout rooms in WebEx. So right now, WebEx Meeting Center does not have it. WebEx Event Center does not have it. WebEx Training Center does have it without video. And Zoom has full video breakout rooms in its meetings. Can you speak about any accessibility features in Zoom or best practices for accessibility while using Zoom? Sure. Zoom actually has uh, full uh, tagging on their web pages and in their client. So screen readers should work with them. And there's actually full documentation for that off of the Zoom site. If we can just get your contact information, we will gladly send you that information and you can look at it yourself. I have a personal paid account with an email address that is at domain.ruckers.edu. Does that need to be changed to at ruckers.edu in order to be included in the automatic transfer? No, in fact, the opposite is true. <laughs> if you have a paid account with a Rutgers email address that is sponsored by Rutgers, leave it. Please don't change it. <laughs> we'll bring it in. If you have a paid account with a Rutgers email address that is not used for Rutgers University business, go in and change the email address or you will be brought into the tenant. If you have a paid account with netid at ruckers.edu, 
it will break soon. Please go and change the email address to something other than netid at rutgers.edu. All right, and we have our final question, which is, does Zoom have the opportunity to create a contact list? Not that I have seen. Zoom is out of the individual scheduling business almost entirely. So what they do is they rely on plugins and or you copying and pasting the invite into the calendar service of your choice. So they won't, I believe, ever have the ability to build contact lists like you have in WebEx where you can have it available. And if that's the end of the Q&A. Yeah, so thank you, Avi. So Avi, I appreciate uh, not only your hard work as well as uh, Janiel's and as well as Dave Gates. Guys, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'm going to pass this back to Bill just to kind of close this out. We're at the top of the hour here at noon, so uh, we're at the end of our meeting time. So, Bill, uh, some final words from you. Thank you, David. And any of the questions that we didn't get to, or if you have additional questions, please contact the help desk, or you can also email eitc at oit.rutgers.edu. A few people I'd like to thank. One, all of the Participants that joined us today, we really appreciate you taking your time out of your busy day. We hope that you found this informative and just the beginning as we transition to Zoom and get the most we can out of that platform. There's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. There's a Rutgers Lecture Series committee members. I wanted to point them out today. There's the steering committee, uh, Kerry Budnovich, Erin Balzik, Janae Baker, Shelley Cousins, Tim DeVito, Danielle Henriquez, Kristen Lepping, Joni Squilaro, Margaret Ortiz, Amanda Pecora, Anna Verma, and Matthew Wilk. I'd like to thank them for all their hard work in deciding what's going to go into these lecture series and doing a lot of the planning behind the scenes, as well as the planning committee. The leaders of the planning committee are Janae, Danielle, and Matt. And I'd like to thank Faison Ahmed, Joy Lynn Almeida, Kenneth Billadu, Steve Como. Shelly Cousins, Tim DeVito, Ed Fabula, Shakira Foote, Michelle McPherson, Joni Squilaro, Randy Suchicki, Amanda Pecora, and Tim Van Wert for all their work that goes into this as well. The webinar support, we couldn't do this without the members of the help desk, uh, mainly Mike Hitchcock and Liz McMillan. Thank you so much for all of your um, work today and behind the scenes as well, and your entire help desk team. And on behalf of the ELT at OIT, Frank and myself would like to thank everybody as the sponsors of this series. And we look forward to seeing you again for volume three coming soon. Um, the information will be up on the Rutgers IT lecture series. The topic will be Rutgers lightning talks. Timing will be in the October, November timeframe. Exact date will be determined. And here are some of the links that I had mentioned in the beginning that would serve you well. The Rutgers IT Lecture Series Survey. You'll get an email, I believe, with that link in it to take a survey so we understand how to better provide uh, topics for you and, and content. The website where the recording will be located is listed there. And any other questions, please email the RUIT Lecture Series at oit.rutgers.edu. And again, thank everyone for your time, and we look forward to seeing you next month. Goodbye and have a great day. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, everybody. This concludes the meeting.